All right, all right. Today we continue in the series Mistaken Identity. How many of you are here for week one? Okay, most all of you. If you missed week one, you got to go back and watch it or listen to it online. Uh, this series, I think, has the potential of being one of the most impactful series probably in your entire life or in this church's entire life if we could capture it and apply this stuff. Um, I'm just so excited as we, as we dive into it. Last week we were talking about the, the rule of the inner image. And the rule of the inner image was all about this. It's, it's what you believe about yourself on the inside always predicts and, and uh, precedes your behavior. And I, we went and we looked at David as he went to go slay Goliath, if you will. And the whole argument that I had over David, this before he's king, is that David's inner image of himself as he sees himself already as a giant slayer, even while he's a shepherd boy. Well before he ever faces a giant, he's already sees an inner image that matches where the Lord is calling him. And we've got to get our inner image right to, uh, to be able to walk into our destiny of who the Lord is calling us to become. Uh, today, though, we're going to now take, uh, I think it's the next critical step, which is each week we're going to be looking at different elements of your identity that are critical to wrap your head around in terms of your identity in Christ as a Christian. So if you call yourself a Christian, this is how Christ sees us. This is how God sees us. Today we're going to be talking about royalty, okay? Now some of you, as soon as I say that, you're like, I don't feel very royal. Maybe a royal mess, but not royalty. And, uh, but here's the main point for today is this. You can never bring the kingdom of the king if you don't know how to live as royalty. And while I even say that, some of you are like, why are we talking about royalty? Well, because we refer to God as the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, that we belong to his kingdom. These are royal phrases that uh, clearly communicate there's this level of royalty that we're involved in. In fact, this idea of royalty, it's not just a Josh idea, it's a biblical idea. Notice what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says. But you are a chosen people, a, say it with me, a royal, come on, say it with me, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into uh, his wonderful light. He's, we're a chosen people, a royal uh, priesthood. In Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 16 and 17, it says this, the Spirit, and that's capital S, Holy Spirit, bears witness within our spirit, small s, that's referring to our conscience. So the Holy Spirit speaks to our conscience and it does something. It, 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 con it confirms within us that we are children of God and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So a lot of times we think of, oh, okay, Christ had access to everything because of course he's the son of God. Yet in this verse, as the apostle Paul is communicating it to the people in, in the town of Rome, he's saying, listen, Listen, you guys are joint heirs with Christ. It's simply this. Jesus accessed his kingdom while here on earth. And in the same way that, uh, that he accessed his kingdom because we are joint heirs with Christ, we can access his kingdom in the same ways. And so here's one of the things I want to do is to help us just start to imagine royalty. One of the greatest terms that has helped me or mindsets that's helped me start to wrap my head around royalty is to think about what's kind of the opposite mindset, opposite of royalty. And so this is the, the ways that I've kind of broken it up. It's a prince or princess mentality versus a pauper mentality. So a prince versus pauper mentality. Any of you guys remember watching maybe the movie, even if it's the Disney version of The Prince and the Pauper? You got Mickey Mouse. You guys remember the story? Are you alive? Okay. You got Mickey Mouse, and it's like, I don't know if he just runs into what is like an identical twin or if they were twins at birth and separated. And anyhow, one ended up as the prince, the other one a pauper. They run into each other, and they decide to switch places. And so then they start living out of the other person's identity and experiencing, the prince is experiencing life on the streets of his kingdom, and the pauper is experiencing life as, as a prince. And here's the different mindsets that go with prince versus pauper mindsets, okay? So just think about this and think, where, where do you land in terms of how you see yourself? A prince or a princess is a son or daughter of significance. A pauper is a son or daughter of insignificance. A prince or princess owns everything the king's, king owns and functions from a place of ownership. 
A pauper has little and functions from a place of lack. It's a mindset that things will always run out. A prince or a princess can speak on behalf of their father. A pauper lacks voice. A prince or a princess carries themselves with confidence and healthy pride of the family that they represent. A pauper is timid, shy, embarrassed by their family, insecure in their identity. So here's the deal. If you're a royal priesthood, you're a royal people, then there are, there's a mindset that goes with that royal mindset. And so my hope today is, and, and it will take you a little bit of time, most of us in this room or watching online will not just be able to hear this message, grab hold of it and go, got it. For me, it took me months to just kind of chew on the idea of royalty for me to be able to really apply a mindset of royalty over my life and over my identity, okay? So this is not usually instantaneous, but if we can get it and start wrestling through it right now, that's the best thing we can do. So let me just give you kind of four observations, at least from what I see in Scripture, as far as who royalty is or things that royalty carries, okay? So the first one is this. Royalty honors purposefully. Royalty honors purposefully. In 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 17, this is what it says. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Now, you got to understand, this verse right here, it's in the context of what I just read earlier, verse 9, where it says, you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Okay, so surrounding that verse, he's going to start giving descriptors of what royalty and how royal people act. And so one of the things he's going to throw out here is he says, honor everybody. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Then surrounding that verse, he even gives some descriptors of some of the groups of people that you might find yourself needing to honor. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Don't we get really excited about that? Honoring human institutions? Uh, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors, verse 18, servants, be subject to your master with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust, a.k.a. you might have a bad boss. And you need to honor them, the unjust, bad boss. The most important sentence probably in these verses, though, is this little two-word sentence in the middle of verse uh, 17 where it says, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God. Fear God. Now, fear God, the, the Greek words that get translated as fear God, it doesn't mean to live in terror of God. It actually carries this idea of being awestruck by God. That we are literally in awe or we live in reverence of him. And it's this idea that I have great reverence for my God, and since I have great reverence for him, the creator of humanity, I must honor his creation, no matter their position. And here's the, the rule, if you will, that goes with this concept of honoring purposefully, is we don't give honor based on who they are, we give honor based on who their creator is. Let me say it again. We don't give honor based on who they are. We give honor based on who their creator is. Because a royalty honors, recognizing whatever you honor, you ascribe worth to. And this is critical. It's so key that we understand whatever we honor, whoever we honor, we actually ascribe worth to that person. See, Christ's sacrifice on the cross helps us understand God's view of each person's worth. Royalty, a royal identity recognizes to ascribe honor is to ascribe God's view of worth over humanity. And so as royalty, part of our, our responsibility is helping people see their worth. And the best way we can help people see their worth is by actually honoring them, even if they have acted dishonorably. Are you tracking with me? That's a good statement right there. This is my come on button. Remember, I just pulled this out. If I feel like something should be inserted there and you guys aren't bringing it, I just press it for myself. It makes me feel good inside. So who in your life would be taken off guard if you paid honor to them? Think about that. See, one of the crazy ways we represent our Father's kingdom is to honor those who by worldly standards don't deserve an ounce of honor, but by heavenly standards we demand it. We, we must demand honor upon those who don't deserve it. Think about people you can honor. Your president. Some people like that in this room. Some people really don't like that in this room. I'm okay with that. 
I don't care how you feel about him. The Bible says you honor. Even if he's done dishonorable things, which I don't have a problem saying he has. We don't honor based on the respectability of the individual. We honor to ascribe worth, to set up their heart to actually receive salvation. You, you can't, someone doesn't understand the value of sacrifice on the cross until they understand their own value. The way that we understand, uh, help people understand their value is to, is to honor them, which ascribes worth to them, which that makes them understand that they are worthy or that, that, that God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That concept is hard to really understand when no one has shown you honor. So it's so important that we, that we honor people. Uh, maybe uh, you might, as students, you might have a bad teacher. You honor that teacher, even while all the other students are not. You might have a bad boss. You might have a parent who has been, quite frankly, a bad parent. Some of you grown adults in this room, you've got parents who have, who you look at them and you go, they're not worthy of my respect, and yet the Bible says, honor your father and mother. That applies to you as grown adults. And what we're doing as we honor them, we're ascribing them worth, setting them up actually for a moment of salvation, to understand Christ's sacrifice on the cross. You, uh, you can honor disrespectful coworkers or peer, peers. Kids in school, those are the rotten children. Uh, or, not that all kids are rotten, I'm just saying. <laughs> There's, if they're acting rotten, you can honor them. Someone in business who has wronged you. But we are people who show honor because you're part of uh, royalty, and that's your royal responsibility. Second element of, of royalty is royalty executes eagerly. Executes eagerly. They take responsibility, they don't pass the buck to someone else. Let me just give you an example here. So Jesus is uh, with his disciples, Mark chapter 6, and he's got this crowd of 5,000 who are in front of him who are hungry. They've been following and listening to him all day long. Jesus looks to his disciples and he kind of throws out a bizarre challenge to them. But in Mark chapter 6, verse 37, he says, you give them something to eat. So he says to his disciples, you feed 5,000 plus people that are in front of us. And the people, or the disciples are like, we'll take a pass. <laughs> They're like, this would take a year's wages just to feed these people. Oh, we can't do that. And here's the, the interesting thing, is if you understand the timeline to which when Jesus says to his disciples, you feed them, he's not asking them for something that they actually haven't got a mindset of, of how to implement it. So just uh, two months earlier, Jesus had sent them out to actually perform miracles, and he sent them with nothing. So they went with absolutely nothing. They had great need. He sent them out to go cast out demons, heal people, proclaim the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now here they are in another situation where they have nothing, great need in front of them, and he says, guys, you execute the kingdom on my behalf, go. And they're like, ah, I'll take a pass. And so then he actually ends up finding the, the bread and the fish and multiplies it, and they have plenty of, of leftover. But here's, here's the point. Royalty always tries to execute kingdom realities, and here's the rule. Knowing the ways of the king empowers execution on behalf of his kingdom. Knowing the ways of the king empowers execution on behalf of, of the kingdom. Uh, a royal mindset is this. Royalty unashamedly takes the bold first step in executing kingdom realities. They don't sit back waiting for permission from the king to execute his heart over a matter. If you remember the story of the prince and the pauper, uh, even the, the Disney Mickey Mouse version, okay? Mickey Mouse is the pauper and he's out in, the, in his you know, in his kingdom, and he sees an injustice happening. And what does he immediately want to do? He wants to step into that moment of injustice and bring justice to it. He even starts saying things like, if the prince knew, this is what the prince would do. And everyone reminds him, you're a pauper, you don't have voice into this, but he wants to bring, he wants to execute the king's heart because he is the king. So, so here's the deal. A pauper mindset will say this, hey, whenever the king arrives, and does something about this, we're fine and we're ready and we're waiting. A prince or a princess says, here's a need, let's try to meet the need the way the king would. Are, are you tracking with me? See, most of my life, there's, there's certain elements of royalty that I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, I carried a pauper mindset, at least in this realm, most of my life. My prayers sounded like a pauper. Where I would say, God, whenever you want to bring this good thing to that person or to me, we're ready. 
as opposed to see a need, meet a need. Meet a need on behalf of the king. Try to bring and execute his kingdom into this moment of need uh, right, right now. I don't know about you, maybe you have a tendency to think, God, whenever you want to bring your kingdom, I'm ready. As opposed to, this is how I, I handle it now, is I simply ask God, what does this situation look like in heaven? That's, that's regularly one of my prayers. God, what does this situation look like in heaven? And then I ask him to align my reality with his. Now, it's this bizarre balance between knowing God is sovereign and knowing that in his sovereignty, he placed us here on planet Earth to represent his kingdom and participate with him in bringing his kingdom. I don't pretend to to be God or boss God around, but I do understand that I represent him and I represent his kingdom. And and so in this balance of God's sovereignty and being his representative, I often ask, uh, does God want me to bring a kingdom solution as I see fit right now here into this situation. And sometimes I don't know. Sometimes I don't get a clear answer from the Lord of like, if my will is his will. You ever deal with that where you're like, God, here's what I want to ask for. I don't know if it's your will. When I can't get an answer on, on that, sometimes I'll get, God, I got 30 seconds. Is this your will? I'm going to ask. I don't have a clear answer. You want to know what I do? I try to execute. I try to execute on behalf of the king. If I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure he'll be gracious to me because he sent me here to execute on his behalf. So, so when the person has the headache and they're like, would you pray for that? Just, Let's go for it. Hey, you've got a, you've got a real business need, and uh, you know if the deal doesn't come through, we're going to have problems. All right, so let's just pray that the Lord would provide a kingdom solution right now to what you're going through, to your business need that you, that you have. And so I just, I try, I always default now to, I'm going to try to execute on behalf of the king. I'm sure he'll offer me grace if I overstep my bounds. That, come on. Uh, that's just, oh, that's how I handle it. Third element of royalty. Royalty carries confidently. Are you aware you're not meant to live as a shy and timid child of the king? Confident. Last week I I prayed this at the end over you. I prayed, God, I see in front of me giant slayers. And, And I really believe that's the identity that God sees over you. That we are like David's. We're giant slayers that individual is not timid and shy. Check out 2 Corinthians 3, 4 through 6. It says this. The Apostle Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He's made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. So Paul actually carried uh, himself and his actions with a level of confidence, not because of really who he was or what he could, what he knew, it was really Christ's abilities in him and through him. So here's the rule. Kingdom confidence is found in kingdom competence and your competence will come from God. Let me say it again. Kingdom confidence is found in kingdom competence and your competence will come from God. Um, I think tons of Christians fall into this realm of feeling incompetent. Let me just throw out some phrases and see if you relate. Do you ever feel like, I don't know enough of of the Bible? I, I don't feel spiritual enough. I don't feel like I'll have all the answers if someone puts me on the spot and starts asking me questions about God or Jesus. I feel a little bit incompetent. Okay, if you feel that way, great. That's not bad. In fact, that's what Paul's talking about. He goes, our competence is not in us. It's in God. And he has made us competent in, as ministers of this new covenant, of the gospel. He makes us competent, and as he makes us competent, that's where we find our confidence. Um, In fact, this is actually regularly the the common denominator in Scripture is God is looking for incompetent people. So if you feel incompetent, you're perfect. He is. He's always looking for incompetent people. In fact, in in Acts chapter 4, it's one of the observations about Peter and John. Now, when we think about these disciples, these apostles, Peter and John, we're like, oh man, these guys are studs. These guys are awesome. They hung out with Jesus all the time. And yet, you want to know what the people saw over these guys? Those guys are incompetent. That's what they saw, Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, a.k.a. 
I thought those guys were incompetent. They were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. The point is, Peter and John, they don't get their competence from their own background and their own experiences. They get it from Christ working in them and through them. I remember the first time I did, I did my first funeral. I thought, man, if this person wasn't already dead, they'd roll over in their grave. I was like, this has got to be horrible. I don't know what I'm doing. I was like, uh, I, don't, um, I don't even know what to do. And we don't do that, by the way. I just, <laughs> but I think I might have done it anyhow, just for funsies, you know? It was like, I was just going for it. But the Lord gave me a grace and a competence for that moment that has given me confidence for many more of those moments. And confidence cannot come according to what you can do. It's according to what he can do through you. Here's the royal mindset. Royalty develops confidence the more we release our own view of ourselves and our abilities and pick up his view of ourselves with his abilities. So here's me with my abilities. Here's God and his abilities. He wants to overlap the two and say, here's you with my abilities in you. That's why we can walk with confidence. Because he makes us competent. Are you tracking? Fourth, royalty lives abundantly. You live abundantly. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 8, it says this, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you'll abound in every good work. That is the most, I've said this before, the most pregnant verse of abundance. <laughs> this thing's ready to give birth to abundance. John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come that you might have life. Jesus is saying this. I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Now, what I think many of us have fallen into is actually a pauper mindset here. It's a mindset of lack. Um, it, it, sometimes we say phrases like this. How are you doing? I'm just getting by. I'm making it. We'll pull through. Now, I agree with you if you're talking about this mindset of endurance. I disagree with you if you're talking about the quality of life or your personal wellness kind of in mind and heart as you endure. Because I believe we are from a kingdom and we represent a kingdom of abundance, meaning you've got all that you need to thrive in the midst of enduring. Are, are you tracking with me? Our culture lives in a constant state of actually the pauper mindset. Marketers in the marketing world, they actually market to paupers. You'll never have enough, enough. you always need more, you've got to get this next thing to be happy. That's, that always feeds to a pauper mindset. The children of the king of kings don't fall for marketing schemes from the world that I've got to buy that next thing because I'm, something's going to run out, because my father's kingdom never runs out. Are, are you getting this? Here's one of the questions that sometimes comes up is that people look at Jesus' life and some people will say, well, Jesus, he modeled what it looked like to live with nothing. So did he live as a pauper? And I would argue that Jesus actually did not model a lifestyle of lack. He modeled what it looks like to live in his lane according to his assignment from his heavenly father, understanding he belonged to a kingdom of great abundance. So he was in his lane. This is what God called him to do. God called him to not have a place to, to lay his head. He traveled from place to place. So he's not going to like acquire a, a kingdom on the hillside because that wasn't necessary for his assignment. Yet throughout his entire assignment while he was on earth, I believe he fully understood, I belong to a kingdom of abundance. Here's why I say that. When he faces the 5,000 people who are hungry, I don't think he freaks out and goes, oh no, what are we going to do? I think he looks at it and he goes, well, my heavenly father's kingdom is a kingdom of abundance. Let's feed them. And notice when he feeds them, what do they have left over? Leftovers. 12 basketfuls of leftovers. He's like, yeah, if we're going to provide, might as well provide at the level that my father's kingdom provides at which is a kingdom of great abundance. Matthew chapter 17, Jesus and Peter are walking toward the temple and they've got to pay the temple tax. One of the Pharisees says, are you guys going to pay the, the temple tax? Jesus looks to Peter and he says, hey Peter, go catch a fish. You're a fisherman. Go on out there, 
uh, catch a fish. The first fish you catch, open the fish's mouth, open up the fish's mouth. Inside will be the, the amount of money necessary to pay the temple tax for you and I. Peter does exactly that. The money's inside the mouth of the fish. He goes and pays the, the temple tax, and they go on in. Now, here's the deal. Did they have nothing, or did Jesus go, my Father's kingdom has everything, so if I need that, we'll just go access it. It's his kingdom of abundance, always having more than than he needed. Even when Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray, he says, think about the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Now sometimes we think about that and we go, okay, so that's just getting by for today. Yet think about every single time we see daily bread in Scripture. Just think about it. When, whenever bread shows up just for the day, how does it show up? Feeding the 5,000, it might show up just for the day, but there's leftovers. There's an abundance of bread for that day, for that moment. Think back to the Old Testament when the, when the Israelites escape out of Pharaoh's hand, out of Egypt, and they start wandering toward the promised land. They, uh, the Lord tells Moses, listen, I'm going to provide for you guys bread on a daily basis. And it's going to be this bread that lands on the ground. It's called manna. And manna literally means, what is it? Because the people walked outside and they're like, manna. What is it? It's all over the ground. It's this like wafer stuff that tasted like honey and it's everywhere. And God gave Moses very specific commands. Tell the people to go on out and take only what they need for the day. But the people, because they had carried a pauper mindset, they go on out there and they tried to collect enough for a week's worth. And God says, no, no, no. I got to break you of the pauper mindset. I need you to understand that you belong to a kingdom. I want you to instill a kingdom mindset. I'll provide for you daily, but it will be with great abundance. So they collect for a whole seven days worth of, of food, and God puts maggots in all the leftovers because he goes, no, I want, you to, I want you to rely on me every single day, but when I provide for you, there's going to be so much that it could provide for a week. It will be daily, but it will be of great abundance, because this is the kingdom we've always belonged to. Are, are you tracking? Okay. So, here's the rule. When your eyes are fixed on what you might lose, which is actually what the Israelites, when the manna was sitting out there, they were afraid they're going to lose it. If they don't collect it, it's a perspective of lack. You'll never see all that you have, which is a perspective of abundance, which is they didn't keep their eyes fixed on their God who will provide for them abundantly day after day after day. When your eyes are fixed on what you might lose, you'll never see all that you have. And most of us don't think to ask even God to provide out of his kingdom of abundance. It, it could look like this. God, release the abundance of grace that I need for that obnoxious person. Because are you aware abundance is not just in the realm of resource? It's in all things. His kingdom is a kingdom of abundance. So you're going to need grace to interact with that obnoxious coworker, and he's got enough for you. God, release abundance of patience that I'm going to need for my children. <laughs> God, release an abundance of resource over my needs today. God, release an abundance of wisdoms uh, for the decision I need. God, release an abundance of forgiveness to offer that person who has wronged me. Abundance is in all things. I need to fulfill, uh, or it's the fullness of mind, body, soul. It's everything you need to thrive in your thinking, in your mindset, everything you need to thrive in your relationships, everything you need to thrive in your needs, everything you need to thrive in everything. And, uh, but here's what I found to be true, is that you'll only try to bring the kingdom in whatever measure you believe you have access to the kingdom and to what you believe the kingdom contains. Here's what I mean by that. If you pray sparing prayers because you don't think you have access to much and you don't think his kingdom contains much, his kingdom will be manifest around you in sparing ways. And if you pray abundant prayers, his kingdom will be manifest around you in abundant ways. It's a big deal. It impacts, this concept totally impacts how I pray. Understanding he's got a kingdom of abundance that he can release upon me in all things. You are royalty and as royalty you live abundantly. As royalty goes, kind of just picture it like this, I'm going to land, land the plane. One of my biggest pet peeves is uh, when I walk downstairs to my basement 
We've got a video game system down there. We've got a Wii U. And now if you guys know a Wii, a Nintendo Wii, it's got discs, you know, that are each game. One of the things that I hate is when I walk downstairs and there are discs all over the floor. Because every one of those discs represents, every parent is like, "Mm mm-hmm, I feel your pain. Uh, Every one of those discs represents like 30 bucks, 40 bucks, maybe even up to 60 bucks per game. One little scratch and the thing's done, you know? And so I walk downstairs, they're all over the floor. And I look at my kids, I go, kids, I tear my hair out. (laughs) Check. (laughs) What are you doing? They're all going to get ruined. They're all over the floor. And the response is always the exact same thing. The kids always go, it's not mine, and I didn't do it. (laughs) They're all sitting around. Maybe they've moved on to the next thing. They're not even playing video games. They're just watching TV at this point. And they all go, it's not mine, and I didn't do it. And here's what I found to be true. As I look at them, as they go, it's not mine, I didn't do it. I go, you're right, it's not yours, it's mine. I bought it, I own it, but I want you to care for it and care about it the same way I care about it as the owner. And as God looks at us over his, his world, God, yes, he is the owner of his kingdom and he's the owner of this world, yet he looks at us and he goes, guys, I want you to care for it and take care of it and execute this realm as I would. As I, the owner, would want you to care for it and take care of it. And so I want you to honor purposefully because that's how, what I would do. I want you to uh, execute eagerly, carry confidently, live abundantly because we are royalty and we represent a king and we're heirs to that kingdom. Amen? We are going uh, to end here by taking communion together. And I thought, man, what a great way to actually end our service. Because are you aware that what Christ did for us on the cross made a way for you to become an heir, a joint heir? Isn't that crazy joint heir? I, I, I feel like I may be worthy of being like a sub-heir somewhere down there, you know? But joint heir, that means I get everything he gets. And as we approach communion, communion is all to take us to the cross. That's the whole point. It's to take you to the foot of the cross to reflect on what Christ did for us to purchase our lives and our souls. And it wasn't just for salvation. He made this purchase to make us joint heirs. But listen to the purchase. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ bought us with his blood and made us free from the law. In that way, the law could not punish us. Christ did this by carrying the load and by being punished instead of us. Because of the price Christ Jesus paid, the good things that came to Abraham might come to the people who are now not Jews. That's us. And by putting our trust in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. He has promised. Uh, Today, kind of as we approach communion, I want to encourage us maybe to just wrap our head around the purchase price that was made for your soul, but not just for salvation alone. It's to, that he might gift us an inheritance and a kingdom to be joint heirs with him. Today, maybe we recognize the price that was paid to make you and I royalty. A couple just pieces of details here in terms of communion. Communion is not for everyone. Okay? It's for those who call themselves Christians. If you wouldn't call yourself a follower of Christ, I would encourage you to just sit back uh, during these next kind of a handful of songs that will be sung. Um, reflect on the words. Maybe talk to God right where you're, you're at. For those of you who are Christians um, and call yourselves Christ followers, the elements are all along the room. So they're on the sides as well as the back. And I would encourage you to go grab the elements and then bring them back to your seat. The bread, it represents his body that was broken for us. The juice, it represents his blood that was poured out for us. And according to scripture, he says, as often as you take these things, do this in remembrance of me. So as we take these, we're celebrating the sacrifice that was made, the great purchase price that was made for our salvation to make us heirs with him and a royal priesthood. So let me pray and then we will uh, we'll worship, we'll remember the cross through communion, and we'll celebrate our royalty. Heavenly Father, thank you for the great sacrifice you made for us. I pray that right now as we come to the foot of the cross, that we might see the purchase price that was made. Your son laying down his life willingly for us 
to make us joint heirs with him. Thank you for that, in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and grab the elements and bring them back to your chair when you're ready. Worship team.